from the struggle for a just green transition, which is part of the uh, European Forum of the Progressive Forces, which has uh, started on the 8th of November and will go on until the 28th of November. So this, uh, um, this um, uh, the, our various uh, lockdown situations has, uh, has led to a digital forum this year, which has allowed us to keep a longer time and have uh, more voices heard in this digital format. Uh, this uh, particular webinar is uh, organized by the uh, GUE NGL uh, uh, group in the, the left in the European Parliament. And especially, I would like to especially thank uh, everybody on the staff and uh, the, the Envy team for putting this together. So my name is Petros Kokalis. I'm an MEP from uh, Athens, Greece, uh, obviously with GUE, NGL, and the Syriza Progressive Alliance. And I'm a member of the Environment Committee and a subsidy member in the Agri Committee. Um, today with us, and I would like to thank them very much for their participation. Uh, we have uh, uh, Lynn Boylan, the senator from Ireland, uh, and uh, an MEP with, uh, from Sinn Féin, and an MEP with uh, GUE in the past legislature, in the previous legislature. legislature. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Iran Kelman, a professor of disasters and health from the University College of London and professor at the University of Adger, of the Free University of Adger. Katie Treadwell is a policy, senior policy officer with the WWF, European WWF, and Leah Achabong is a senior policy and advocacy officer for climate finance uh, at the European Network on Debt and Development. Um, so uh, let me just uh, spend a cup. I would like to uh, let all the participants on the Zoom know that there is um, um, a globe apparently below at the controls uh, next to record and between record and reactions and this will lead you to different languages being interpreted we have english french and greek and, uh, and, uh, we would like also in the uh, interest of uh, zoom hygiene to ask you to keep your microphones muted including when you're listening to music or watching other videos and uh, use them only when uh, you want to speak and please raise your hand if you want to do so unless i do give you the floor as i am the moderator here for this next uh, couple of hours and i would also like to welcome uh, mary Toussaint, french mep with the greens uh who's gonna kick off after my introduction and welcome welcome mary uh, nice to have you here on the uh, European Forum of the Progressive Forces. Thank you for joining. And, uh, uh, so, um, this is Ronan. Okay. So, uh, there seems to be some uh, violent relation joining and giving us a tone for a very otherwise very dark discussion about climate barbarism because as a matter of fact, uh, with the uh, current um, uh, public health crisis and the pandemic, we are witnessing what looks very much like a, a climate crisis in fast forward, uh, a crisis which, uh, uh, which uh, threatens everybody's life and health. Um, not threatens, but you know, threatens bravely. Uh, and uh, we see the reaction of, uh, of politics and organized uh, uh, societies to that threat. Uh, we see it in fast forward because in this uh, pandemic, we are all uh, expecting a vaccine to uh, come and uh, liberate us and uh, bring us back to what we were before, which is not a very good place to be. Place which we were before. Um, was uh, was a place that was heading for uh, that is that was that is heading to uh, um, an increase in the in the uh, temperature of the planet, which would make it uninhabitable for humans, not least for uh, millions of other species in this uh, biodiversity crisis, which follows as well. So uh, we have seen uh, during this. Uh, 
past months, uh, an extreme acceleration of inequality. We have seen that uh, the virus is, the coronavirus is much more likely to infect and kill uh, people with less access to public health, people with uh, less access to zoomable jobs. Uh, and in general, we have also seen a tightening of a security state and a surveillance state. We have seen a fast tracking of democracy. We have seen a number of traits which uh, we will not, uh, we do not want to see normalized in the future. On the contrary, we want to come out of this uh, crisis uh, wiser, not expecting to keep doing the same thing and expecting to, to have different results, but uh, realizing that uh, the very structure of, uh, of our economy and uh, the way that we, we prioritize, uh, we have priorities in, this, in, in our societies uh, leads to, um, uh, leads to uh, deteriorating uh, and, 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 uh, and, uh, and in the end uh, diminishing um, quality of life and life itself. Uh, we understand now that the, uh, and we understood before the, the pandemic, we had ample scientific evidence, very much like we do with the climate crisis, that uh, uh, it is our means, our ways of production and consumption that has increased the risk of uh, pandemics. This was a clear, um, it was a very clear warning from the scientific community and a very low level of action and preparedness on the part of the most developed countries in the world. So um, we do not, uh, so using this as an example, it is crucial that we look at the just transition towards uh, a zero uh, emissions world, uh, a transition that uh, makes sure that we leave no one behind, but what does this really mean and how do we do it? If it's clear that if we don't go to net zero, uh, we will have a world with much, with very few resources and with uh, a lot of people fighting over them. We know the scenario about uh, uh, the uh, climate refugees in a, in a plus four degrees world. And this is a complete dystopia and probably an end of topia um, as well. So uh, this has been a lesson on how do we, what is the struggle ahead for the progressive forces to uh, make sure that the transition is just, takes everybody's interests and wishes uh, under consideration and delivers on, uh, and, and not only building, but back better, as is the slogan of the, uh, of the new um, democratic president of the United States, who we all welcome back to the, uh, we are waiting to welcome back to the Paris Agreement. Um, but uh, as the UN says, how do we grow forward together? Uh, and uh, this is a, a call for all the progressive forces that needs to inform our narrative going forward. So uh, without, uh, with no more of this uh, uh, introduction, I would like to give the floor for 10 minutes uh, to Marie Toussaint uh, to, uh, to tell us more about her work in uh, the parliament um, and uh, the defense of uh, climate, uh, the defense of climate fighters and uh, the ecocide. Marie, please. Yes, thank you, Petros. Um, I'm actually, um, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for wel welcoming me uh, here. So I thought I would speak after and, you know, understand better um, what are your expectations, but well, I'm- Well, you are welcome. <laughs> if, if, you, if you like, we can do that uh, as well. No, no, it's fine. I mean, um, yeah, you, you ask questions, I will try to answer them. And um, also I'm reading the chat. I opened the chat. So if you have any questions, mm -hmm. um, please let me know. So I'm, I'm quite happy to be here and about the issue of your um, well, conference and, and workshop um, today, because it's true that we have such a challenge um, now in front of us to overcome the climate crisis, but which is, uh, of course, more of everything um, and a social crisis and, and uh, uh, inequality crisis. And um, this is something that we have to work on together. So maybe just to give you a few words about who I am and what I did before I became a Green MEP. 
Um, I'm an environmental lawyer and I, will, I, well, I grew up in a family of um, activists against uh, poverty. So I was already kind of an activist, um, you know, at the moment I was born. Um, but then I got involved in uh, ecological issues. And since I became a lawyer, I am using law as a tool to protect the climate and the environment, but I'm also um, uh, using it as a fighting tool um, and as an issue itself of mobilization, especially through the recognition of climate and environmental rights, climate and environmental justice, but also I work a lot for the recognition of the rights of nature and of ecocide. So I was active for, for a few years in France um, in that direction. I joined the movement and ecocide on earth in 2012, and there was at that time a citizen initiative for the recognition of ecocide. I'll get back to that. Um, and in 2015, I founded a French NGO, Notre Affaire à Tous, which uh, led different climate litigation actions, uh, among which L'Affaire du Siècle, which was the biggest um, climate litigation action with 2 million supporters that was launched in, in December 2018. Um, we're still expecting the results, and they should come in the beginning of 2021, um, but that was to give you a bit of an input. So when I got um, to the parliament, I mean, we had, we have had um, this huge wave for the Greens in the 2019 elections, and we also had this huge uh, wave of mobilization outside of politics throughout the world. In Europe also, um, and Greta Thunberg is, is Swedish, so it's, She's a European, um, but, but it was the first really global movement uh, from the youth to protect the climate. So that was really uh, beautiful, I believe, for all of us. Um, but at the same time, uh, of, as this green wave, and I'm sure you shared this analysis, we also had um, the fact that all the liberal forces um, still won the elections and stayed um, at the governments of almost all the countries in the EU and also of the European Commission. So as long as we had this green discourse, this green speech, uh, even of Ursula von der Leyen uh, since the day she was elected by the European Parliament, it didn't really turn out into some laws. So just um, yeah, to give you an overview of how we are fighting right now um, inside of the European Parliament, and then I will end up um, with also the work uh, of mobilization from the European Parliament. But inside of the European Parliament first, um, we got this Green Deal, uh, which was very good news. Um, and Ursula von der Leyen also pointed out that she wanted a Green Deal, which leave no one behind, uh, which was also something that was really important because since 2020, 2001, the EU has been integrating um, social dimensions and social indicators, but you know we still don't have these binding indicators on social issues and also we still don't have environmental justice indicators in the meaning that we cross social and environmental inequalities um, but this promise from van der Leyen was a pretty good one um, and from the beginning we were quite vigilant on what the green deal would be and you know in the 30s in the us when they um, pushed for the Green Deal, it was a new contract between um, public services and private sector. And that's not what we saw there. What we saw was a list, a full list of environmental legislations to be modified or to be created, um, which is already something good. But I mean, we're not revisiting um, the entire economy as we should have been doing. Um, and this is something that is still lacking today. And we see that when we fight over the budget, like we did this uh, week in the European Pl Parliament plenary, we see that there are some improvements, but we still don't divest completely from fossil fuels. We still don't hold the big polluters accountable um, with uh, adequate taxation and also liability rules uh, outside of the taxation. We still don't mobilize the necessary money to transform really our economy. So these are all, you know, the weak uh, pillars of this Green Deal, um, not revisiting, re reorienting the economy. Um, but then we waited, uh, of course, for the laws to come and we are waiting for very good laws actually. 
Uh, we are working on a framework to help deforestation in the world, for instance, which is really good. We are also working on the forest strategy for the EU, which is a bit less good, um, but we're waiting for a due diligence and a revision of the corporate governance. Um, all these stuff that are uh, quite nice for access to justice on environmental matters where we want to, you know, uh, improve um, the state of play. So, you know, this is this kind of mixed um, evaluation with um, some improvements in the system, but still really no, no real redirection of the policy. And we had this climate law. Um, and the climate law is really, really important in many regards. Um, we presented amendments to go further than the 60% that were adopted by the EP in October. 60% um, is, I mean, if we really reached the 60% uh, reduction of emissions by 2030 of CO2 emissions, then we might have a chance to respect the Paris Agreement, but, but this is not certain. And we would have needed uh, way more. But right now, the Commission and, and especially the Council are fighting for less. So we still have this fight to lead. And what was important for us was also with this climate law to create allies. Um, so we asked for a high council of climate, of experts on climate, which would be able to ensure the transparency over the policies that is led and the results that are done, which is really important for us to control the fact that the governments are really acting uh, for climate. And we also uh, inserted in the EU climate law uh, measures to make the goals binding and to ensure access to justice from citizens. I'm not sure this is going to work. We'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, it was really important for us. And of course, we have holes. Uh, the climate law says that we should divest from fossil fuels, but we lost on the date. Um, so when you have no date, it's just, you know, a promise like this. But then we still need ha to, to work on that. And one of the main issues that we have in the parliament today um, is natural gas. And, and just before turning to rights of nature and ecocide, I'd like to make a point on that. Um, natural gas, which is also linked to the will to develop hydrogen, because we're still, we're still not sure how they will feed each other. Um, but usually, and in the past, the parliament was quite progressive uh, compared to the council and the commission. Right now, we have a council and a commission who are ready to put gas aside, but the European Parliament, who insert gas again in the finances and the infrastructures policy as soon as they can. So we're working a lot since the beginning of the mandate to be able to you know, fight this trend. Um, and we're, we keep on losing, even though we're losing less and less. So we hope that we're going to win. Uh, in the in the coming months, but this is not there right now. And we lost at several moments. Um, we lost when we tried to oppose the PCI list, which is a list of infrastructures that can be financed for two years. Um, and, and the parliament can accept or reject the list. So um, I went to look for other MEPs. We were 103 MEPs to oppose uh, the list uh, from the commission, but we lost. Then we tried to oppose again um, the fact that gas would be in the just transition mechanism and we lost again. Um, and now we try to get the gas out uh, of the recovery facility. And we kind of lost, but you know, we tried, we managed to not to get the gas um, quoted as something in which we should invest, which is well, not, not a complete win, but not a complete loss either. Um, and we have a huge challenge in front of us with the revision of the 10-year regulation, which will decide of the infrastructures that we finance in the coming years now. Um, and there, we really need also everyone's mobilization to kick gas out of this, because if we finance gas again, then we will be locked up in fossil fuel infrastructures for the next 30 or 40 years, which will prevent us from reaching our climate goals. So, you know, we say something on the one hand, but then we finance something contrary at the com com complete opposite on the other hand. And this is something that, yeah, we, we need to fight. Um, I could talk for ages, but since I don't want to keep the floor too long, just also to tell you that um, we have a very strong challenge um, in the 21st century. This challenge is the environmental challenge. And, you know, each century had this challenge. Uh, we had the, 
the, the challenge in the 18th century for civil rights. And then we had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which wasn't so much universal, but that's another issue. Then the 19th century, we had the Industrial Revolution. And we got there a lot of changes in European law about social um, uh, improvement and social rights that we won at that time. Um, and, and in the 20th century, we were fighting against war and destruction. Um, and we had, again, um, uh, universal human rights to get recognized, but also cultural rights and the foundation of the International Criminal Court to fight against war crimes. Um, and in the 21st century, we have an environmental challenge and it needs to be traduced in the, in the law as well. And that's why I'm fighting a lot for a new generation of rights, um, a new generation of rights with, uh, which would recognize the environmental rights to a healthy environment for everyone in the respect of social justice, so environmental justice. And I'm quite happy because in October, we managed to get the European Parliament to call for the recognition of the universal uh, right to a healthy environment. And this can sound weird, but this is not the case yet. So we still need to fight in that direction. And this is not a fight that we have won and we really need here again to have a mobilization. But this is also about recognizing the rights of nature, which can seem to some people to be quite weird. But um, you know, we've given rights to states, we've been given rights to companies and to a lot of other fictions. And now we have to work on the recognition of the rights of nature. This is a trend that is going on uh, globally, all over the world, in very different ways. And this is not happening in the EU, but we need to make that happen in the EU and giving it a European uh, interpretation. So basically for me, the rights of nature are first the recognition of the rights of nature to um, regenerate at a natural rhythmism. Secondly, the fact that we allow nature ecosystems to uh, reach out to justice so that they would get a legal status um, and have legal tutors that can act in justice on their behalf. And thirdly, um, to have and to, to give nature a voice in the democratic um, discussion, which can be done through ecosystems parliament that are now um, beginning to be set in place by collectivities and NGOs on the EU territories. So this is something that is quite moving. And again, in October, we managed to get the parliament to um, call for the recognition of uh, ancient and primary forests as global commons to which a legal status should be attributed, which links it to the discussion um, of the Convention on Biodiversity, the CDB, which will take place at some point in 2021, which is the International Conference for Biodiversity, where there is a paragraph saying that uh, we need to work on the recognition of the rights of nature at the global level. And then to end up with all of this, um, uh, of course, I talked to you about ecocide, the gravest crimes against the environment at the beginning of my speech. Um, and the first time ecocide was pronounced in, in an international conference was in 1972 in the conference of Stockholm by Olof Palm, the prime minister, in his introducing speech to the conference. He used the word ecocide to denounce um, the use of the agent orange and the dioxin in the Vietnam War. And yeah, I, this defoliant was used to kill the vegetation and then to allow the army to kill Vietnamese more easily. But it actually still now, 60 years later, still have an impact on the ecosystems and on the people. And we've seen several ecocides like this happening um, after that in Bhopal in India, with Chernobyl and Fukushima, uh, also with Deepwater Horizon uh, and the Chlordecone in the French Antilles. Um, and, and in December last year, the republics of Maldives and Vanuatu. Uh, tabled an amendment and required, requested the International Criminal Court to add ecocide as the fifth uh, gravest crimes um, in its statute, in the Roma statute. And this was an official request from these two republics, and they were talking about climate change, saying that climate change is leading to that disappearance and is um, uh, leading to the violation of human rights and human dignity, as well as ecosystem dignity, and that now we should really punish uh, ecocide. 
this, the issue of ecocide is rising. Um, we've had the Citizen Convention on Climate in France requesting its recognition. The new agreement uh, of, the, of the government in Belgium also um, raises the issue of its recognition. And in Sweden, uh, different parties and trade unions uh, push together for the recognition of ecocide. Um, so this is, yeah, boring. And um, I founded an alliance, an international alliance of parliamentarians for the recognition of ecocides last October. And this is um, one fight that we will lead with determination uh, in the coming weeks. And we'll be really happy if anyone here would like to join also this alliance. I have well, uh, in the chat. I don't know if you want me to answer now or... No. I think we'll take the questions in the end uh, and uh, would like to thank you for your contribution and uh, um, be, be uh, gladly part of the Alliance for Ecocide. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's my honor and pleasure uh, because this is a fight which is going to be fought uh, by far uh, a lot in the courts, but only also in political assemblies, but of course also in stock markets, in cities, in farms, in neighborhoods, and of course on the streets in the future. Uh, so um, uh, I will take something from your discussion to introduce Lynn Boylan, who is a senator in Ireland, used to be uh, an MEP for uh, uh, in the past mandate with GUE and with the Sinn Fein, and. Uh, um, Marie, you talked about the weak pillars and how we are going forward in reorienting as opposed to redesigning uh, our, uh, our system to face, uh, to, to, to face the climate crisis and go about climate action. Uh, and uh, as uh, Lynn is going to talk about uh, uh, an eco-socialist approach to climate action, in our um, language, socialism is about uh, incre incrementalism, uh, going revisionist, it's not revolutionary per se, but uh, uh, there is a question now of time and urgency, which uh, will probably demand something more revolutionary, revolutionary than what we're seeing in the European Parliament and in the Council and the Commission right now, even though we are taking very radical measures. So, Lynn, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Yeah, th thank you, Petrus. And I also would like to, to join the Alliance for Ecocide. <laughs> so you can put me down on that. Um, and I hope that maybe in the Q&A, we can delve a little deeper into the issues around uh, nature having a right in its own sense, because my background is also as an ecologist. so. I think the biodiversity crisis is definitely the poor cousin of the two crises and um, we need to have a better focus on, on our obligations to uh, our lived environment. But as I said today, I'm going to talk about um, I suppose why we need to take an eco-socialist approach to climate action. And I think it's because what we see certainly in, in Europe is the the mainstream media that leads us all to believe that if we have a greener lifestyle with a keep cup uh, for our coffee, buy our stuff in plain brown paper packaging that looks vaguely compostable, uh, before you know it, the, the planet will be saved. And it's all about the individual measures. And so all of our focus is diverted there while the fossil fuel industry and, and everything else that the issues are all uh, allowed to continue. Um, so I think that addressing the climate uh, barbarism in which we find ourselves is going to take more than just those tokenistic changes. And the premise of that argument is that we don't need to fundamentally change capitalism. We only need to change it to make it green. Um, to an eco-socialist like myself, I think that the, the notion that we can green capitalism is absurd. Um, there are some who are sceptical of eco-socialism, um, certainly the, the Irish version of the Greens are sceptical. Um, they think the eco part is a front for an ideological mission. But I think it's important to examine why an eco-socialist perspective is so important, um, because this perspective forces us to ask, why is capitalism unsustainable? And the answer, of course, is that the, the word is growth. You know, capital demands growth. It's simply an immutable law. And where you have growth, you have resource use, whether it be fish, forests, or fossil fuels. And if we lived in an alternate universe or capital where we have infinite resources, um, then we wouldn't have an ecological problem. We wouldn't have climate barbarism. But we don't. Uh, we live on a finite planet. And when capitals 
infinite growth runs up against our planet's finite resources, then we get terrible results. We get climate chaos, we get political instability, we get climate uh, barbarism. And I think that that some think that it's it's almost that it's greedy to ask that we have a just transition. And I've heard say that, you know, we shouldn't overly focus on human rights when it comes to climate action because it just slows down the process. Um, but look, we can't we can't ignore human rights. We can't ignore the fact for a just transition, not only just because it's not going to fix the problem, but also because we have to bring people along with us on this process. Um, and I think asking, you know, to give up fossil fuels is like asking, asking capital to give up fossil fuels is like asking it to give up oxygen. So we need to demand the complete uh, transformation of the energy system. Uh, it's not sufficient for delivering a just transition. And I also think that we need to broaden out the concept of a just transition from just a few polluting sectors um, because we need to deliver a just transition for everyone. Uh, and it's a lot of the time it's way too narrowly focused as to what a just transition is because it's for our depopulated rural communities, it's for the poor, for the working poor, for women, for the elderly, for homeless people, for people with disabilities, for young people, and for people who feel the effects of climate change and for the people that already do. Um, so I think focusing on a just transition for a few sectors feeds into the narrative that we just need to decarbonize certain sectors. Um, so we focus our attention on a just transition. We owe a, a debt of gratitude to the labor organizers and the activists who did the groundwork for us, people like Tony Misachi from the Oil, Chemical and Atomic Workers Union, um, because for far too long environmental policy was seen as a zero sum issue. And if you were helping the environment, then there would be costs for the economy. And I think Tony showed us that you can actually bridge that chasm with a radical alliance between labor and environmental justice. And he showed us that it was possible to have a fair economy that is environmentally just as well. Um, in Ireland, we're no different to other European countries. We face the, the, the same problems of implementing a just transition for the people working in carbon intensive sectors of the economy. Um, for us, it's not coal, it's uh, based on the extraction of peat for the generation of electricity. And uh, many organizers uh, believe that industries like fossil fuel extraction will have to be nationalized because that's the only way that there's a hope for a just transition. Unfortunately, um, Ireland's is nationalised <laughs> our peas extraction and it hasn't made it any better for the workers. Um, so the Board of Mona workers are state employees. Um, it should, that should make it much easier for us to deliver a transition. But unfortunately, even just last night, those workers were uh, informed that their work is going to end before Christmas. And we have a just transition policy in place by the government, but there has been zero jobs created for those workers. So it's just on paper. Um, the, uh, sorry, but if we focus on the just transition, the just transition asks us to fundamentally restructure our economic system to deliver for human need instead of profit. So I think we need to raise our ambition and deliver a Green New Deal for all. And the Green New Deal is the creation of jobs and there's certainly enough work to go around if we're talking about creating jobs, retrofitting houses, building our public transport infrastructure, reconstructing our energy grid. However, the other challenge is uh, how do we square the Green New Deal and the creation of jobs without growing the economy? And creating all of these jobs does promote rapid economic growth and that then compounds the climate emergency. So I think Naomi Klein uh, has certainly put it best, better than I could ever do it in her book on fire um, and the, the need to focus more on those jobs that don't necessarily grow the economy or further drain our limited remaining resources and that that's to build the care economy and over the last year we've seen the need for an investment in care professions like teaching, child care, care for older adults, the sick, the vulnerable and domestic housework and coronavirus uh, has certainly shown us how difficult our lives become without this type of care available. For everybody who's been working from home knows the problems of childcare and 
domestic work and all of that, that's generally unpaid work uh, at the moment. So I think it is possible that everyone can have a good job, but we have to reimagine what constitutes a good job. And the pathway for delivering ecological and social freedom is through universal services. I don't support the universal basic income. I think we need to move to a position where it's universal basic services that meet everyone's needs so that we aren't forced to provide everything for ourselves individually. I think that the climate law is definitely a tool. Um, of course, Marie talked about the parliament trying to put pressure on the you know, for greater ambition, but even if we accept the 60% ambition target, um, that's still not climate justice compliant. I mean, that's not enough ambition for the EU um, to, to, to fulfill its, its climate justice obligations. Um, so I think we just need, we need to be far more ambitious uh, with what we're doing within the EU. Also, when it comes to biodiversity, as I said, I think it's the core cousin of the two crises. Um, and I think there's very much uh, an anthropocentric view taken of biodiversity that nature serves us as opposed to us being part of, of nature. Um, and this idea of ecosystem services and, you know, and payments for ecosystem services, like there, there's talk of paying farmers to leave land aside and then to be able to trade that as a credit for somebody elsewhere to pollute. Um, and I think that's wrong morally, politically and economically. I mean, on that basis, just let the farmer farm the land rather than let, uh, leaving it fallow so that they can sell the credit elsewhere. So I think we, we need to have a, an agricultural model in the EU that supports farmers. It makes sure that they have a, a livable income um, and, and pay them absolutely to protect the environment, but not so that then they can package that up and then sell it onto a market-based system um, to allow people to, to offset their, uh, their carbon intensive lifestyles. Um, and I, I am fundamentally opposed to the, the policy of offsets at all. Um, I think it's a form of neo-colonialism that particularly from the global north telling people in the global south that we know best, we've destroyed our environment and now we're gonna tell you to manage yours so that we can continue to live uh, the way we are. Um, so I think also like looking at, as I said, in agriculture is a huge problem for us in Ireland. Um, we need a just transition for our farmers here, um, but we need to start looking at how the EU policies don't add up, how we're doing one, arguing for one thing on one hand, and then on the other hand, completely contradicting it. So that's the trade policy of the EU does not square with its climate policy. The, the cap policy doesn't square uh, with climate action. So, I mean, in Ireland, we have, we have a system here where farmers are not making enough to pay to live, to have a, a decent uh, quality of life, but yet we're, you know, breeding cows to produce milk, uh, to be powdered, to be sent to Asia, to convince women in Asia to not breastfeed their children um, and to use Irish Irish milk. So, I mean, that that's just not a joined up approach. And I think that that's why we need to, to go back to the drawing board um, and, it, and look at it and look at the whole system as opposed to just tinkering around the edges. So. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Lynn. Uh, uh, broad, uh, broad aspect of the transition, and it is a broad aspect because this is an all-consuming crisis, and it's uh, well, it's uh, uh, the concept of the twin crisis in by the biodiversity and the and the, and the uh, global warming. It's interesting. It's pr practically one crisis um, uh, caused by our consumption of fossil fuel, with its effects on the atmosphere and the biosphere um, and um, I think that the the use of the word anthropocentric which means uh, human centric it's very apt uh, because this is a discussion where uh, we are not uh, so much uh, um, in the business of uh, protecting the, uh, uh, the environment as such or the planet as such the planet has practically no problem that it can understand uh, but uh, it is also it's more humans have the problem and humans have caused the problem and therefore um, uh, humans should be liable for it and humans should be able to fight to to change it 
So uh, I would give the floor to Ilan uh, Kerman, uh, Professor of Disasters and Health um, uh, at the University College of London. Ilan, the floor is yours for uh, 10 minutes. And uh, please remember to bring your questions on the chat here or in Facebook. Thank you so much and a pleasure to be here, although obviously not a pleasure to be here discussing the issues which we are discussing, but thank you so much for organizing this and for the opportunity to bring these issues to the forefront. Particularly as Lynn said, it is a systemic system, systematic problem, which we really have to address by considering these wider and broader issues. So we know these problems that we face. And thank you so much to Marie and Lynn and the others for your inspiration in trying to solve them and to all of you for being here and for being part of the solutions, especially part of choosing appropriate solutions. But how do we necessarily do so? How do we lead and educate on these very vague terms that we've been using to really try to prevent what caused the problems and to solve them through building, through choosing a post-pandemic world, which will not only focus on the pandemic, but also other challenges, such as what has been mentioned regarding climate change. And how do we ensure that we really focus on these fundamental systemic problems, which we are trying to address here, when we talk about sustainability and greenness and avoiding barbarism, and especially through what has been raised by both Lynn and Marie on the baseline of justice, rights, and equity. So yeah, we're in a pandemic. We know the climate is changing rapidly. We know that we are responsible for both and that we need to stop what the causes are of both of these. But should these specific ones, climate change, the pandemic, really be our focus? After all, if we stopped human-caused climate change today, and if we stop the pandemic tomorrow, would we actually solve these problems of equity, justice, and rights? We have a never-ending list of reports of explaining, which explain sort of the environmental destruction, and Lynn mentioned in particular fish and forests. Well, fisheries collapse was predicted by 2050 because of overfishing not because of climate change. In many places, deforestation is leading to worse landslide and flood disasters, far more than any changes in the weather, far more than any changes in rainfall. So no matter what the climate does, no matter what we are doing to the climate, these are our disasters. These disasters are not natural. In fact, almost no disasters are natural. These our activities, cause of vulnerabilities, which place people in harm's way. We can also look beyond climate and viruses, such as to the lack of earthquake resistant structures or people living in coastlines without warning systems. Even without climate change, even without a pandemic, our activities would continue to put people in harm's way. In fact, even powerful interests behind overfishing and large scale logging, they have argued that, you know what? Climate change is going to destroy these resources anyway. So we might as well exploit them while we have the chance. This is ecocide, as Marie mentioned. This is the terrible discussion which we hear from those with the power and with resources. And they have similar interests in supporting corruption and construction, which kills thousands of people during perfectly typical environmental events like earthquakes, landslides, and floods, which we should be able to deal with, but we choose not to. So these disasters are from us. They are not natural. Without climate change, without a pandemic, justice, equity, and rights would still be absent because these powerful interests are still destroying people and the environment. So it's this fundamental value of immediate exploitation of people and nature, which we have to tackle. They're not considering the real costs. They're not considering the cost to us or to the environment over the long term. It's basically this value 
which has led to human caused climate change, this value which led to the pandemic, and of course, so much more. It is basically the value of short term gain for long term pain. This is destruction and destructive values far beyond COVID-19, far beyond climate change. So why do we tend to focus on one issue? I mean, okay, the pandemic, because we're experiencing it, but why do we highlight climate change so much rather than putting our efforts into tackling, as Lynn put it, the systemic challenges, the basic causes of our values? Of course, it has to include greenhouse gases and wildlife smuggling, but it must go far beyond that. It means changing the fundamental values which lead a small minority of humanity choosing to live completely out of balance with people on the planet, thus ruining it for the vast majority, exactly as was mentioned with regards to carbon offsets. So human-caused climate change and disease outbreaks are there but there are only two manifestations among many. Yet we have COP26 for climate change. Think about that, 26 meetings. This has been going on for longer than many of our audience has been alive with no end in sight. Where is COP1 for our values? Why not pivot COP26 into COP1 for a just, righteous, and equitable planetary future covering so much more than climate change. You know, we have a United Nations organization dedicated to climate change. It is separated from the UN organization dedicated to environment, to development, to health, and to stopping disasters. Sustainable Development Goal 13 on climate change explicitly separates climate change from other sustainable development activities. And then we wonder why we have such little action on cli against climate change. The separation just does not make sense. Everything is linked, stemming from our values and the values we avoid, such as prevention is better than cure, a value which holds for pandemics, for climate change, for earthquakes, floods, landslides, tsunamis, and so many others. So we do and we should speak of justice, equity, and rights, but we should be considering all of these within the same context, such as, you know, one basic example is health, health systems. Many countries do not even have adequate health systems to deal with day-to-day -day health. So of course they fail during a pandemic. Of course they cannot cope with climate change or an earthquake or a landslide. This is the chronic crisis of inadequate healthcare for everyone, missing equity, justice, and rights. It inevitably creates acute crises like a pandemic, like other outbreaks. We even look at the fact that the world spends more than 10 times on government departments of defense and weapons than we spend on official international aid. 10 times. Now, notwithstanding all the problems with the international aid system, at least it tries to help people. In the meantime, governments are using our tax money to subsidize the fossil fuel industry at perhaps two orders of magnitude more than governments invest in all forms of prevention, including for pandemics. The fossil fuel companies are nationalized already. We just don't call it that because it's the taxpayers paying the cost, it's the private shareholders getting the gains. This is what we must rebuild better. So perhaps we should consider stopping to blame the climate, stopping to blame viruses. You know, don't blame climate change, don't blame disease for our catastrophes. The real crisis is us, how we think, how we act based on our values. So yeah, climate change and the pandemic are each one symptom of these causes, which lead to more, much, much more. So thank you for being with us here to try and say, how do we tackle that? I'm going to put my social media contacts into the chat on Zoom. So please join me, please connect, please discuss and debate. 
For those of you not on Zoom, just search my name. You can find me on Twitter and on Instagram uh, and other places. And please let us know what do we need. We've identified the problem. We have plenty of brilliant, brilliant ideas from solutions, as we've heard, and we're going to hear from the next speakers. How do we ensure that we are all implementing them together? Thank you for being part of it. Milan, thank you very much for this uh, contribution and for this speech. Uh, truly inspiring. And uh, yes, we're going to look you up in, not on social media and hear more from you. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know where to start to commend that you have taken, taken really a systems approach to a systems problem and uh, gone down to the core of it, our values and the way we are organized around it. So um, I'm not going to try, I'm just going to um, uh, just uh, console uh, Katie by acknowledging that she has a very hard act to follow. So uh, our next speaker is Katie, Katie Treadwell a EU policy officer, European policy officer with the WWF, which is doing uh, very good work in across very many fronts and very active in the just transition in the narrowly defined sense of the trust, just transition as well, the kind of just transition that the just transition uh, uh, fund and the just transition mechanism deal with it, with helping the uh, transition of the coal regions. And Kate is going to talk to us about the lessons learned from coal transition, coal region transition, and how can this can help us go forward. Katie, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thanks a lot. Um, it was a hard act to follow, um, but hopefully I can keep you engaged. Um, yeah, um, when I was approached to speak um, at this event, I did think about giving an intervention focused entirely on the just transition in coal regions. And whilst I will draw lessons learned from that, because that's where I have most policy experience, um, I think it's it's something that's much broader. And I think um, Lynn was also referring to that. Um, climate action, biodiversity action, which I really please has already been mentioned as well. Um, and the just transition are needed everywhere and in every sector, and we have less and less time to lose. Um, so I've actually tried to go a bit broader and tackle how can we, given the Green Deal and the Just Transition mechanism are now falling into place, ensure a just transition. Um, do we have enough on the table already? Um, I would say that no, uh, there are still elements missing and we can't be sure that the final legislation or the implementation of it will be right. Um, I'd also agree with the other speakers that this is really about systemic change. Um, something that's a lot bigger, it's really a kind of transformation. Um, on the other hand, the front line of the transition in Europe is in coal regions. Uh, even though action is needed everywhere, coal is really carbon intensive and it's very damaging for both the climate and the environment. It needs to be phased out as soon as possible and by 2030 at the latest, if we are going to stand any chance of limiting global temperature rise to below the 1.5 degrees Celsius, that the IPCC has shown to be the cliff edge for potentially catastrophic climate impacts. Coal combustion, but especially coal extraction, is also very regionally concentrated, which again is why the just transition often applies. And so the effects of an unmanaged phase out risk being locally very painful and already um, damaging for already vulnerable communities. In a way, uh, coal communities are the litmus test of whether we can deliver a just transition. Um, but one thing is clear, delaying the transition will not make it more just. Coal regions are already under strain, and we know that from economic studies, continued coal use doesn't guarantee jobs or well-being. Continued use will instead mean that we continue to damage the environment, cause land subsidence, water contamination, air pollution, and all of the negative health impacts that go along with it. In Turov, in Poland, for example, communities across three different countries, the border region, are fighting for their water supplies as PGE threatens to expand a mine which will operate until 2044, which again is not really indicative of a just transition. Planning for a slower transition and continued use of coal and fossil fuels also ignores economic reality. Coal is on its way out. In Poland, for instance, again, coal imports are increasing, which undermines any argument about energy security. Carbon costs are only going to rise further and renewables are going to get cheaper more efficient alongside batteries and other innovative technologies. 
We need to send a clear investment signal now that coal is on the way out to give the time needed for communities to diversify their economies and avoid the cliff edge, which will devastate them. And we only have 10 years to really start the action taking off. So we need to start now. I would argue therefore that phase out dates and timelines for the transformation are a first principle to ensure a just transition, also for subsidies. They provide clarity and stimulate the right investments to make the transition cheaper, particularly by avoiding the creation of stranded assets. But what we're seeing in the biggest economies instead is a fight. Ooh, I can hear. Okay, a fight to delay the transition. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance (BNF) uh, recently published its 2020 Energy Outlook, which takes a purely economic approach. Um, they don't consider aspirational policies, and they highlighted that even without policy interventions, coal power will decline. Power will decline in Europe to virtually nothing by 2030. And yet Germany, Poland and Bulgaria, particularly, all propose to continue using it and therefore they need to subsidize it. In Germany, they'll pay their coal operators off to keep business operations running until 2038, despite the fact there's a clear indication they would have closed in most cases anyway. Poland wants to maintain the status, eh, sorry, the status quo until 2049. And Bulgaria has stated its intent to maintain coal use for the next 60 years. This is public policy and it's sending completely the wrong signals and raising costs while holding communities back. The transition will require concerted investment to help diversify economies into more sustainable sectors. And the Just Transition Fund is a symbolic, although not financially substantial, step towards that. I'd underline here it's important to remember it's not just about the Just Transition Fund. All public and private investments need to contribute to the transition or at least they need not to undermine it. The two key things I think are important to point out about the Just Transition Fund are the plans which you need to access it, as these enable the strategic timelines to be developed, which I mentioned earlier, to deliver a just transition. And of course, the second thing is the signal it sends, both to underline a commitment from the EU to help communities transition, and also to define what a just transition is. And here it's where we hit the big snag. The Just Transition Fund allocations are currently shared out without any conditionality on commitment to deliver climate action. There is no need for a member state to have any actual intention to transition in order to secure funding. You can take the examples there of Spain and Greece. Both have delivered in the past on climate commitment and both are phasing out coal. In the case of Greece explicitly, in the case of Spain implicitly before 2030. This isn't easy for either of those countries but reductions in coal use, especially in Spain before 2020, will mean that they receive fewer funds to transition than others. On the other hand, Poland sees very little decline in coal use by 2030, and Bulgaria, as I said, shows the same kind of trend, um, and they'll both receive vast sums from it. And then there is Germany, which, as I said, is phasing out by 2038. There's an interesting report you might be in interested to look at uh, highlighting this from Can and Ember called Just Transition or Just Talk. I can post that in the chat later. And um, so what does all this mean? Not only will we risk seeing funds going down the drain under the current proposals, we risk setting a pretty poor pre precedent that if you go slower, you'll get more help. There are some rays of hope in the current negotiations, such as the green rewarding mechanism proposed by the parliament, and of course the infamous 50% conditionality for the funds. Uh, to be dependent on a commitment to 2050 climate neutrality in the EU. But this is quite weak as it only affects Poland. Secondly, we're seeing another big threat, exploitation by the gas industry. This is perhaps linked to the first principle on timelines, as without clear direction and phase out dates, as well as the clear vision of where we are heading and what systemic transformation we're actually seeking, there is a tendency to swap one bad habit for another. The Parliament fell for it by making gas eligible for funds in their Just Transition Fund position, and the gas industry is now fighting to be labelled sustainable on the back of that win in the taxonomy. But this simply risks limited Just Transition and recovery funds subsidising a lock-in of gas as we move out of coal. Gas can't act as a bridge, and the lifetime of investments that we make in it are just too long. It's also not consistent with climate action. It's wrongly labelled low carbon, and we mustn't forget methane which is responsible already for around 25% of global warming. It is also not needed for heating solutions if we take a 10 year 
for longer perspective. But most strikingly, when we talk about EU funds and especially just transition funds, finance and gas, we forget key pillars of what a just transition is. Gas doesn't create jobs, especially not local ones, and the jobs don't diversify the local economy or help us move forward to a more sustainable future. A second pillar for just transition is therefore that it must not lock in new fossil fuels or prolong their use, and fossil fuels must therefore be unambiguously excluded from all public funds. Thirdly, if you want to leave no one behind, you need to make sure you know who we are talking about and what they want. There's a real need for partnership and consultation, which is often acknowledged on paper, for instance, in the ILO's guidelines on just transition, and even by the fact the Commission has a European code of conduct on partnership, which is binding legally, but it's not properly enforced. Too often we see box ticking ex exercises, consultations, and as someone in a civil society organization, too often I hear that it's not clear how comments and ideas have been taken into account when you actually look at the programming documents. Partnership is paramount to the just transition because we're talking about addressing local level impacts. In what a macroeconomic level probably looks not too bad. So what can we do to ensure a truly just transition? I therefore argue in the summary, we need to define it. We're missing clear principles for what makes up a just transition. As the European Off Policy Office at WWF, we're supporting our national offices to deliver their just transition work. And last February, we published a summary of the findings from analyzing the economics and experiences of transition in coal regions in Germany, Greece, Bulgaria, and Poland. We came up with five rules for ensuring a truly just transition in coal regions. And the first of these was to put in place phase out dates aligned with Paris, so before 2030, followed by economic diversification, meaningful partnership, and planning the transition, objective analysis of data, and adequate funding. But these five rules are specific to coal regions, and we need to go further. It's fine, for example, to say that we need partnership, but we also need to deliver it. We need to know what it means in practice, and we need to enforce it. Getting the principles for just transition clear will be crucial if we are to integrate these principles into policies more broadly, which, as I said, is key to ensuring a really just transition, sending a clear signal of the direction that we're heading in. We will need them as we revise the state aid guidelines, as we revise the ETS um, and other legislation coming up in the next years. Um, I do appreciate I'm running out of time but we have been developing principles for just transition more broadly at WWF and we'll present them soon in the context of our territorial just transition plan assessment tool. But to conclude, although we need these principles, they will take time to develop and to agree. We must tackle the immediate threats building on what we know is needed for a just transition already by making the just transition fund conditional on climate action and faster coal phase out. We need to enforce the partnership principle and the legally binding European Code of Conduct on Partnership so that each territorial just transition plan and each recovery plan under the Just Transition Fund and Recovery and Resilience Facility has been developed with input from the people and not just the usual suspects, the largest companies, although they need to be involved too. And finally, most crucially, we need to keep fossil fuels well and truly out of the EU funds, including to keep gas out of the EU funds. And I'll leave it there. Thank you, Katie. Great job of following uh, her life from going to, from the general to the specific and drawing lessons as you have been doing uh, with your organization throughout Europe. Um, and uh, I'll just keep the, you know, the, the idea that all public investment is transition investment and uh, just can't help myself just asking also myself is it just transition or just talk uh, there is no question that there is a huge uh, uh, movement towards climate action but it is not always uh, and rarely done quite correctly there is a lot uh, hiding in the details and uh, lynn asked if we can have uh, if we can green capitalism uh, Marie pointed out to the series of uh, losses that we have had in the parliament, in the PCI, in the Just Transition Fund, maybe in the RNF, uh, a small win in the Sustainable Europe Investment Plan, a big loss at the uh, Common Agricultural Policy. So um, uh, we need to really put our money where our, uh, our mouth is and do it correctly. This is something that there has really no second chance and uh, the battle about uh, the fossil gas 
is really raging all over the, the parliament. Um, uh, and the, um, the unjustness of the Just Transition Fund regarding uh, the, um, the speed, the, uh, regarding the level of unemployment growth or the level of uh, adjustment to the energy mix that is needed is really, is really blatant and jumps out. But this is something that uh, um, probably pales in comparison when we start discussing, turning the discussion outside Europe and discussing about uh, uh, development and transition and debt and the, um, uh, the role of uh, colonialism in the past centuries of exploitation, as Ilan put it, um, which is now has turned to the discussion of debt and climate justice. Not only there's a debt question, but also uh, the irrefutable fact that the historic emitters, uh, which are in, basically in the North, uh, are making uh, the, 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 the habitat, let's say the habitat, yeah, the habitat of people in the South are even worse than they're doing in the North. So uh, the hotspots uh, of, the, of climate change are in the South. And this is where we have a discussion about uh, um, uh, debt, for, debt for forgiveness is not the word that I would choose, but uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, Leah, Leah Asapon is senior uh, policy and advocacy officer for uh, climate finance and the European network on the, from the European network of uh, on debt and development will uh, take us through for the next 10 minutes of this discussion. Leah, the floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you, Petros, and thank you to Gua and GL for inviting me to speak here today. Um, as Petros said, I want to talk about uh, international climate finance for developing countries in the global south and also how that links to debt as well. Um, I'll try and be fast with my intervention so that we can get to the Q&A session and uh, start a good exchange. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to a rapid and immediate downturn in economic activity around the world as a result of lockdowns and travel bans. Um, for many developing countries in the global south, they are attempting to react to the COVID-19 pandemic whilst experiencing ongoing climate impacts. The compounding nature of these impacts is making it difficult to put in place and enforce COVID-19 measures, for instance, uh, at hospitals and um, uh, stable internet feeds in order to share information during a, an extreme climatic event, etc. All of which is impacting developing countries' ability to meet their own needs during these crises, thereby exacerbating um, their, their country's risk of falling into a debt trap. And so there's a real need to ensure that the overall amount of available public finance does not go down as this would impact developing countries' ability to tackle climate change and to invest in sustainable development. Given that 2020 is the delivery year for the global 100 billion USD climate finance uh, goal for developing countries to be met, it's especially concerning that more hasn't been said about achieving the goal or about what developed countries will do to implement the extension of the goal at a national level between 2020 and 2025, especially in the wake of, of ongoing climate impacts. We've seen multiple storms and cyclones in 2020, extreme storms exacerbated by climate change, the most recent of which is, is Storm Etta, which I'm sure most of you have seen. And the majority of these uh, extreme climatic events are being disproportionately felt by developing countries. As such, it's incredibly important to ensure that a sustainable and green recovery to COVID-19 includes a strategy uh, to ensure that climate finance levels do not diminish. One without the other will not suffice. It's in the interest of all to ensure that the world recovers together, to ensure a resilient global recovery. Uh, and this must include countries, international financial institutions, as well as investors. In light of this, some public development banks 
agree with this and have started incorporating COVID-19 and climate risks into their recovery financial resources, for instance, the World Bank. However, whilst this is a usual first step for the World Bank, research from the World Resource Institute shows that from January to July 2020, only 21 out of 62 World Bank development policy finance lending programs uh, appear to contain actions that support climate and environment objectives, indicating that whilst the World Bank is committed to playing an important role in helping countries integrate climate action into their core development agendas, they are simply not walking the talk. Eurodas own analysis of uh, the International Monetary Fund's programs shows similar figures in that only one out of 81 programs includes climate change considerations as part of program design, demonstrating the slow uptake of climate measures into financial mechanisms. What's more, last month's Green Climate Fund private finance conference also shows the increasing trend of many developed countries to use public finance to leverage private finance. During the current global context, it doesn't make sense for developed countries to use public finance to subsidize private investments for non-public services in developing countries, particularly not when public budgets for health, education and sustainable development are falling in developing countries in part due to more public money in developing countries being used to pay back loans and debt incurred from loans uh, granted instead of grants. Climate and debt interact in several ways, but both make developing countries' von existing vulnerabilities worse. Developing countries are facing a growing debt crisis, worsened by the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic and ever extreme climate impacts, and the, growing, and the growing debt crisis hitting the global south has a direct impact on governments and economies' capacities to deal with climate emergencies, loss and damage, adaptation and mitigation. Eurodad's research shows that despite this year's G20 debt service suspension initiative in the wake of COVID-19, that this is only for a limited number of the world's poorest countries, and that the debt crisis will likely be intensified by the increased primary fiscal deficits that developing countries will incur due to COVID-19, mainly because financial support for developing countries to tackle the pandemic is being provided principally in the form of new loans, all of which means is that there are fewer resources available to tackle climate events and to invest in climate mitigation and adaptation. A lot needs to change. The COVID-19 pandemic presents the opportunity to change the current status quo and to create systems that enable consistent flows of finance, to change financial systems to work for small and local initiatives and projects, to put in place systems that remove gender, racial, ethnic, indigenous and social barriers, including barriers for the LGBTQI community, and to ensure that there is enough public money to invest in public services. So what can be done to advance this agenda? Reform of the financial infrastructure to integrate climate action is only as useful for vulnerable communities as its ability to unlock new and additional climate finance. Developed countries urgently need to provide new and additional climate finance and work with developing countries to ensure that financial contributions truly address developing countries' climate finance needs, including by outlining how they will fulfill the continuation of the existing global climate finance goal between 2020 and 2025. Climate finance providers, be they countries, funds, public development banks, should use the measures, policies and needs outlined in developing countries as climate commitments, particularly NDCs, nationally determined contributions, NAPs, um, national adaptation plans and LTSs, long-term strategies, as well as economic development plans as a basis to determine where finance is most needed and how to advance a developing country's long-term economic and sustainable development goals. 
This will also support developing countries' objectives to have at least 70% of climate finance going to support local level climate action by 2030. Currently, the majority of climate finance flows go towards supporting mitigation measures, which are seen as the most profitable climate action measures, with very little going to support developing countries to address losses and damages that they are currently experiencing. This can be done by climate finance donors focusing on projects that additionally try to institutionalize climate risk management and adaptation, as well as focusing on a, a projects that aim to address losses and damages. What's more, countries and shareholders in public development banks, be they national or multilateral development banks, should also use the unique, unique circumstances of COVID-19 as an opportunity to provide new mandates for public development banks to become green development banks that actively support development finance programs that have co-benefits with achieving the goals of the Paris Agreement and the SDGs. Public development banks must begin working with, with developing countries to ensure that financial contributions from such banks truly address the needs of developing countries. Country coalitions such as the Coalition of Finance Ministers for Climate Action, as well as international financial institutions, must also look at how to address the impacts of certain financial instruments. Research from Imperial College London shows that developing countries are paying additional interest due to their climate vulnerabilities, equivalent to an extra one US dollar for every 10 US dollars of, of interest paid. 2016 projections estimate an additional 146 billion USD to 168 billion USD could be paid in interest by developing countries over this decade alone. So it's imperative that highly concessional finance and grants are favoured in order to reduce the burden of market rate loans on developing countries. Debt cannot be allowed to prevail. Countries also need to support and participate in a post-COVID-19 debt relief and sustainability initiative in order to bring developing country debts down to sustainable levels. Easing debt levels will also allow countries to become more climate resilient by freeing up domestic resources to invest in adaptation and mitigation. Not taking sufficiently ambitious actions in relation to debt relief amidst the growing debt crisis in the global south will leave developing countries even more ill-prepared to deal with the climate crisis. And to conclude, I'd like to echo what's already been said by a number of the previous speakers, which is that then it's imperative to ensure that the space for local civil society and communities is created in order to ensure that they can share their knowledge on the climate vulnerabilities that exist within their communities of the climate impacts that, are, that they are feeling and to help address, uh, manage the climate risks of existing financial infrastructure. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, I think that uh, picking from the last point of the famous leave no one behind, uh, who is this one and uh, what does she want? Uh, how do we include uh, this discussion? And I think that your use of the more technical uh, language of uh, finance, development, debt, uh, is really the, um, the most uh, harsh and uh, uh, painful way to mask the, um, uh, the justice rights and inequity discussion that the land had brought uh, up before. Um, I would like to have a discussion on uh, another point that Leah raised, the COVID-19 as the opportunity to uh, change the status quo, as the opportunity to call for a new mandate, and as an opportunity that needs to be seen in uh, terms of uh, urgency and, uh, and has to be radical in terms of urgency, in terms of scope at the very least, and in terms of equity as well. Uh, I know that half of you have been answering questions on the chat, uh, there are a couple of ones that need to be picked up. I uh, I'm not sure if you really want to. Uh, I think I would like to take a round of very small interventions uh, from everyone. 
uh, on what has been discussed and uh, then perhaps pick up any question that remains uh, unanswered. Uh, I would also very much uh, like to address the um, the main inequity, the north-south inequity, which is uh, the basis of the climate justice discussion, how it all started, but uh, going also forward to the um, uh, discussing the uh, rights of nature in relation to the One Health approach, uh, the approach of uh, uh, which we now have. Uh, so, um, Marie, would you like to to go first? And maybe there are a couple of specific questions for you if you want to address them or if you want to have a general remark. Marie, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Yes, I'm here. Uh, sorry, I was going up the chat to remind me of the questions that were at table at the beginning. Um, first of all, thanks a lot to everyone. I think this is um, yeah, really important and interesting to have this really broad uh, approach on the climate justice is, um, issues that we have to deal with. I'm sorry, I'm putting my yeah, camera right again. Um, maybe and to begin with, just on this issue of, of climate justice and development aid and everything, like, you know, there was this summit uh, finance in common that we had um, with friends, again, trying to give lessons to the rest of the world, whereas our uh, bank developing bank development banks and investment banks are still financing a lot of fossil fuels projects abroad um, and this is again the contradiction that we see with these neoliberal guys who are saying that we need to change everything but they keep on feeding the beast the money and finance beast um, and we really need to get them to move for real and definitively because we also have this ways back and forth um, on the climate and environmental issues. But on the issue of climate justice itself, um, seen in a broader way, I think that the concept of planetary boundaries crossed with the concept of um, ecological debt uh, and, and unequal um, ecological exchange is one of the keys if we want to reach a real equality at the global level. Why is that? Because we have been talking about limits of the planet for a while now. Um, well, at least since the very famous limits of growth report in 1972. But since 2009, we have nine planetary boundaries that are science-based, quite solid ones, and that are coming to define what could be a safe operating space for humanity, which means that if we cross those boundaries, and I will quote a few, few of them afterwards, if we cross those boundaries, then we put in danger the future of humanity and the future of the entire living uh, on this planet. O among those uh, nine planetary boundaries, we've crossed at the global level already four of them, and at the EU level, the same. So it's first climate change, of course, second biodiversity, but also um, the, the cycles of uh, azote and phosphorus. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know so much the words in English, but you got what I mean. Um, and behind, we also have um, the, the use of land, uh, use of soils, and we have other issues like acidification of the ocean or, um, or water uh, for the people. Well, if we look at those planetary boundaries, then we need a bit of work still to um, be able to define them with precision, to update them uh, as soon as we would need to, to update them. But we also need to have a political discussion once we have agreed upon the concept and that it should be part of our governance. And what would be the discussion? It would be about the allocation of share. And if we look at it, if you look at the EU, for instance, you can say, okay, we're gonna define the share of the EU, if you, while just taking into account the size of population. We take the proportion of population, like I don't know how much it is, maybe 15%, and then we say that we can consume 15% of the planetary boundaries of our space, right? Available space. Um, but then if you take the historic responsibility, it's way less. If you take also the capacity to act then it's again less. And if you take um, the ability for the peoples of the world to decide over their own future, 
which is a sovereignty allocation um, target, um, then you are uh, to an even less extent. So I'm, I try to be clear, I'm not sure I am, but that means that if you look at planetary boundaries or ecological footprint, then you say, okay, we need to respect that. But once you've said that, you haven't said anything if you didn't look into the distribution of what can be consumed and produced um, by the peoples throughout the planet. And also um, about the issue of, of climate justice. Um, for the moment, we have targets, climate targets, concerning the emissions on our territory. And up to that point, we do not even cover every source of emissions because we're just beginning to work on methane emissions. But what we absolutely don't deal with is the imported emissions, actually the delocalized emissions. And since the 1990s, we've been delocalizing pollutions and jobs altogether because we needed to reach a reduction of our uh, CO2 emissions inside of our territories. So basically, France still have the same ecological footprint as in the 90s, whereas we're like they're like we are the leaders in climate issues. But no, we haven't really reduced our emissions. And if you look at Germany, Germany is delocalizing in the Eastern Europe, so that you have this um, rideau de fer, the new Berlin Wall, between countries who want to act for the climate and countries who don't want to act for the climate. That's not true. That's not true because the countries that are supposed to want to act for the climate are delocalizing their pollutions in Eastern Europe. And now they have to deal with, the, with our emissions, just like the countries in uh, Asia and Africa have to deal with our waste and our toxic waste. So all these things really need to be addressed um, in this overall discussion. And we really need to change the framework and the governance uh, of the European Union, inside of the European Union. And I'm really pleading in favor of a just and fair a planetary boundary to be um, inserted in the governance of the EU instead of the current budgetary rules, which don't make any sense, because if you don't care about protection of the environment and, um, and social involvement, then you don't solve anything. Um, then just to say a word about the rights of nature. Um, no, there was another question about uh, environmental justice. Um, so the question, I will read that so that everyone gets it. Um, what do you think how progressive forces can help poor people who need to hit it with waste during winter? They have no money for using clean energy and they are victims of air pollution directly. Can we have a special fund to help them in every member state of the EU? Um, there, when I say that I really want to push the European Union to have an environmental justice strategy, um, that would be the aim of this environmental justice strategy to deal with those huge inequalities that are making people who pollute the least to pay the most um, to fight against pollution and climate change. In France, as you know, we had this big movement, the Yellow Vest movement, um, and everyone made people, well, push the government, try to um, say that the Yellow Vest were anti ecologist people. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work um, because the Yellow Vests were not anti-environment uh, and anti-ecologist people. And um, I, I even wrote a book with um, the, the, one of them, the, the woman who made the petition, which give, gave birth to the movement. And what we're saying is in these books is that you always see the same. And I will get back to what Ilan said a bit earlier, but um, I would put it differently, actually. Um, each time when people want to earn money, they dominate uh, the earth and the people. And this dates from the colonization from the 15th century. And we've always been doing um, this, this, exploiting people and nature all together. Um, and, and for me, that's the same movement. That would be my difference with, with Ilan. It's not the same causes, it's that you know, we're doing the, both at the same time. Um, and one is made, if we exploit nature, it can also be used to exploit people. And if we exploit people, it's always in order to get access uh, to natural resources and the destruction of nature. Um, well, it, it 
can seem a bit far from your question, Attila, but actually it's the same question. Right now we have people who are suffering from energetic uh, of poverty. We have some people that are dying from pollution. And of course, it's the people who are the most vulnerable, those with the least money. Um, and we don't do anything to help them really. And when we have environmental um, fiscality taxation, then usually it weighs more on them than on anybody else. That's why we need so much an environmental justice strategy, a strategy which will rely on the participation, the real participation of the people, a strategy which would mobilize funds um, to be able to improve um, the habitat of the, of the people and especially the most vulnerable. It's also why we need a just uh, fiscal environmental strategy. Um, and I hope that we can also work in that direction because for the moment we just have nothing um, except from some few first research from the environmental agency, whereas it should be worked um, together with social agencies as well. Um, yeah, so we really need to work in that direction and we need to work together, of course, um, but we just haven't really begun this work. Um, and, and on the rights of nature, what would it change? For me, the rights of nature is really something that is useful. I'm talking to activists here, um, but the rights of nature is useful for, I would say, yeah, ecologists, but also many left people who are thinking that we need to live in harmony with nature. But it is also really useful to talk to the people who are a bit further from uh, politics and who are really focusing on their relations with nature, the fact that they love the trees, the rivers, their gardens. Uh, also, a lot of literature and cultural uh, work is based on uh, our love to nature. So first of all, as a strategic way, it's a real strategic um, way of gathering um, people together, uh, to my mind. And then um, in a concrete way, um, rights of nature could change a lot of things um, when it where it is already recognized for instance in um, Colombia we've seen and, and Ecuador we've seen um, quite interesting um, decisions of justice up to that point especially with the rights of the Amazonian forests and it pushed for a new governance um, to be settled um, Colombia is not always working as a state of law so it is quite difficult to implement these decisions, but this is quite promising. In Ecuador also, um, some forests were protected from mining and we're waiting also for a, a very expected uh, decision on Los Cedros Bosques um, in Colombia right now. And we hope that the rights of nature will help again, closing some mines uh, and also disimplementing some dams in some places of the world. In Pennsylvania, in the US, where they recognize the rights of nature, it also allowed to forbid uh, fracked gas all along the river. So this was also a really concrete um, decision and win. Uh, and we can have a lot of other concrete um, instruments to protect the planet and to, and to implement the environmental goals with the rights of nature, because what gives the rights of nature the people, it's new tools, um, to go and you know prevent the companies and the states from damaging the environment your environment also the place you live in um, and these are quite important tools and then just to end up with that this is also the philosophical revolution um, which i was calling for in my first intervention saying that each century had its, its challenge and the way in as a philosophy we tra translated this challenge into law for me and i'm french but uh, law is really our social contract i say i'm french because it's from jean-jacques rousseau right and we also have this french philosopher in the end of the 20th century michel Serre, who wrote the natural contract and this is an invitation so that we arrange rules, we adopt rules for our societies, constitutions and laws that um, compel us to live in harmony with nature and with one another. Um, and this is, to me, the biggest philosophical and civilizational step that we need to take right now. Thank you very much, Marie. Um, I would like to give the floor to Leah because uh, there is a question which is a little bit technical, but Leah has to leave us sooner than everybody else. So, uh, Leah, there is this question which 
would bring us from Zanzac or so all the way to debt swaps. Uh, but I think it's the same uh, really question. The question is where would debt swaps for debt swaps for the environment be one of the solutions for reducing the global south debt, but also protect the environment? I think we've seen some movement in that area. Uh, so please go ahead and give us a few words of wisdom. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Petros. Um, I, I do have to leave now for a priorly, priorly accepted engagement. Um, but just quickly on the issue of debt swaps, this is a um, quite a con contentious issue. It's something that we've seen work in, in previous years in relation to debt for nature swaps, um, uh, whereby uh, funds are, are liberated in order to um, uh, ensure that a um, schemes are put in place to ensure that a, a developing country's debt is transferred into the hands of a different creditor and that creditor will, will um, likely attach conditionalities to it that um, uh, either will, will remove, for instance, high interest rates or um, create longer um, uh, maturity and, and payback times for, for the debt itself. And so, but in return, the developing country would have to um, uh, engage in uh, some sort of conservation effort. This is something that we've, um, that has, uh, we've seen take place in um, some Southeast Asian countries. Um, and we've even seen that NGOs um, such as the Nature Conservancy have um, taken on that, have bought that debt and taken it on and provided those um, favourable conditionalities for developing countries. Um, I'd say that this is something that is, it's certainly a discussion that is being had, not just in the context of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, but also in the context of the G20. I think it's too early now to say um, what the, the opportunities could be for climate change, particularly because what we see is that when, when initiatives um, such, when innovative climate finance initiatives like this are presented, they can in some cases lead to the sort of low hanging fruit being, um, being pursued. And by that, I mean cheaper mitigation options, um, which then leaves developing countries with all of the expensive loss and damage or expensive adaptation uh, options. They're being left to, to try and pay for that themselves, whilst additionally having to make uh, loan repayments. So I'd say that we need to um, uh, have a longer discussion about this. Eurodad is bringing out a paper on debt and climate that um, should come out uh, early early in 2021 and within that paper we will be uh, outlining a, a clearer position on on this topic um, but for now I would say that um it, it's just too early to to properly be able to say with with any sort of certainty that uh, debt for climate swaps is is a good option is 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 the the way forward um and with that, I would like to, to close by saying that to all of the policymakers on the call and to all of the, the citizens and residents on the call, I would implore you to reach out to your national climate, climate, um, climate and environment ministries and to your national finance ministries and um, push your, your ministries and push your governments to say, what they are going to do to fulfill the continuation of the existing global climate finance goal of 100 billion USD. That goal was extended from 2020 to 2025 under the Paris Agreement, but as of yet, countries have not made it clear how they will be uh, continuing on with that extension. Some countries have, have said very vaguely, um, uh, we will um, be be wanting to use guarantees to fulfil this um, extension, but guarantees can lock countries into, or can lead to countries um, being forced into unfavourable monetary policies. And so, I would Im implore you all to to um, get onto the case of your your national ministries and ensure that 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 climate finance goal um, is is met for 2020 and going on to 2025 in the form of highly concessional 
climate finance. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Leah. Uh, this, uh, uh, next this, year's uh, forum. <laughs> yeah, perhaps better than that. Uh, looking forward to see the debt and climate uh, report coming uh, in uh, early 2021. Um, uh, debt has this uh, strange way to be in the center of the discussion between uh, justice and power uh, since, since farming, I guess, uh, since large-scale farming began. Um, so I would like to, to give the floor to Lynn, going a little bit, uh, discussing a little bit about the all this innovation that needs to happen to reach the net zero, um, to the net zero world, not only in technology, but also in politics and the climate law is a sort of political and, and regulatory innovation. And of course the Paris Agreement, but also in terms of uh, finance and uh, in, with instruments such as we discussed earlier. And um, so I would like to, to have this question about the, the valuation of natural capital or so-called ecosystem services. And, uh, and how does that fit in, in, in your view of, uh, of a socialist way of, of climate action? Can we give a value to, to the services we take for, for nature? And would that you know, really change the scales and up, change the scales in terms of, of debt and, and finance? And of course, anything else you would like to, to uh, uh, Yeah, I can, I can address that. And I'll also probably, I think there's a question in the chat box about the citizens assembly approach that uh, Ireland took to, to its climate action. But yeah, I mean, I, I have a fundamental problem with putting a price on nature. And I think it just, it leads to the, the further commodification of the commons. Um, this idea, the concept that we can't value something for its intrinsic value, that we have to put a monetary value on it in order for people to respect it. Um, the problem with it is, and, and, I, and I can see there are some very genuine people who you know, really think that this is the only way that we're ever going to protect nature um, and they're doing it out of frustration, but I just think it concedes the ground completely because once you put the price on it, there's always going to be somebody who has pockets deep enough to buy their way out of having to do whatever their obligation is. I mean, that's always going to happen. Um, but it also just changes the nature which, how we, how we, we live with, with our lived environment around us. And I would much rather see a rights-based approach to nature and what Marie was saying that, you know, nature should have its own rights. And, and that, that argument or that conversation is happening. And it's really exciting about how do you give nature its own voice when it comes to the law and in Ireland at the moment we have our our climate bill is going through uh, pre-legislative scrutiny it's a very very poor uh, draft bill that we've got which is deeply disappointing because we have the greens in a coalition in our government at the moment um, but one of one of the, the experts we've had in was discussing the need to include a legally binding reference to biodiversity in your climate action. So yes, biodiversity is threatened by climate change, but equally biodiversity can be threatened by climate action. So you need to have that, that holistic view of how you take climate action so that you're not, that biodiversity is not the trade-off in order to take climate action. And I think that, you know, a lot of people are not, not aware of that or they think of it in too simplistic a way that you plant a few trees and that's dealing with climate action like for example in Ireland we, we plant Sitka spruce which is an invasive monoculture and um, we pay farmers to do that <laughs> to me and and we pay them because the land the, the most biodiverse rich part of the land is is the, the poor land the land that can't be farmed and rather than paying them to just leave that we're actually saying no plant that up with an invasive species that actually undermines biodiversity so i think it's really really important and um, so as i said i fundamentally disagree with putting a price on nature for those reasons I, it's marketizing it but i think that we have to have a joined up approach around addressing the biodiversity crisis and the climate crisis and if you don't have a legally binding mechanism to force that climate action has to take account of any negative in, com, consequences for biodiversity. Yes, in some cases, biodiversity will lose out. There's always going to be trade-offs, but 
you have to, you know, you have to take account of it in the first place and to weigh up those those options. And I think that that's a much better approach to take rather than um, financializing it. Then in, in, in terms of the, the citizens assembly, um, it's, it's something that's now been introduced in other countries as well. I think the Scottish Climate Bill has uh, opted for the citizens assembly approach. So in Ireland, it was that 100 people are selected randomly. Um, there, you, you know, you, it's tended out to like a polling company and they select the 100 people or the 99 people and a chair. And then they look at topics that I suppose are sometimes seen as politically difficult or contentious and to bring abroad. So we've had citizen assemblies now in Ireland on abortion rights and very successfully um, the citizens assembly allowed the heat to be taken out of the debate and then, you know, people to have calm measured conversations and it was the same with climate action um, it was very interesting very very progressive views came out of that citizens assembly uh, you know that the people were calling for changes to agriculture they, they called for just transition but I would I suppose just say to if, if countries are looking at using the citizens assembly it's also important that those who choose the experts who come before are choosing from a diverse range of views. So a little bit like in France, we have issues with the carbon tax in Ireland. The Citizens Assembly voted in favour of a carbon tax, but they never heard a contrary view around carbon taxes. No expert was brought in to offer them the, the other alternatives to it. So I think Citizens Assembly is a really positive approach. It's participatory, but it is very important that the back working of that makes sure that you hear from a diverse range of views um, and then the other thing is because with the climate bill we were looking at should you have a, a permanent citizens assembly so that you always have participation as climate action progresses but the evidence would suggest that then your your citizens assembly no longer is reflective of society because they become captured because they become experts on the issue. So you have to uh, either have kind of rotating citizens assemblies or move away from that once they've decided on what the action they want their state to take. And then you have to move to a different form of, of participatory democracy uh, for the implementation. Well, uh, like, um, like uh, we don't have, we have yet to invent the technologies that would bring us to uh, zero carbon. Uh, we have yet to invent the political forms of organization and the political narrative that will bring us there in a just way. So I will not, in the, I will not repeat uh, the previous, uh, the previous uh, action of uh, having Katie follow Ilan. So I will give the floor to Katie for another five minutes and then Ilan, and maybe I can take the uh, question that came in about climate refugees from, the, from Facebook and move forward. Thank you very much, Lynn. Katie? Thanks. Um, I won't take quite that long. So, um, yeah, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, like I said, I'm, I was really pleased to see that we're really talking now about systemic change. I mean, the just transition is one part of, of achieving, um, achieving a, a, the, the change that we need and actually tackling climate change. I don't think you, you can if you ignore the social side. Um, so, yeah, I... I think, first of all, we're talking about systemic change now. The just transition is not just applying to single sectors. I, I completely agree with what Lynn said in her first intervention on that. Um, and that's why we need a broader definition. And, and I think previously it's been defined by it's been defined by, by trade unions, and then that's been really, really helpful. And yet at the same time, we need it to go broader now. This needs to be much more about the entire system changing and what what are the principles that we need for that? Um, so I think, first of all, if we talk about a transition in that name in itself, we're talking about a kind of slow change in a way, a transition. Maybe we should now start thinking about just transformation, um, thinking about really big systemic changes. Um, there's also, I think, with that, we also heard about some kind of threats really coming from the kind of, the pressure to keep the status quo um, that we see in, in societies at the moment. So we, we have this, this pressure to, to keep the current system, the current uh, capitalist system. Um, we, 
we do have a, a very limited way of defining what successful economies look like. Um, so GDP based, um, obviously, um, the, touching on that with, with the valuation of nature, um, which is a difficult one because in a way we do need to know what's, what damage we're causing to it. Um, in order that we can repair it. But I, I mean, I'm no expert on that front. Um, I have a biological background, but that's about as far as it goes on that one. Um, but I do, I do agree, it's, it's, we need to maybe move away, away from purely looking at things in economic terms, in the traditional economic sense, and looking much more, much more at the well-being side of things. Um, and so, yeah, I think we need principles of what we're really talking about here because we're kind of grasping at strands in some respects. We know what we want, but we don't know what we want. Um, and so, yeah, first, maybe we need to think about how we measure our success, but then we also need to really think about what does that success actually look like? What are we heading towards? And for that, I think it's quite clear that just transition strategies, that was something we pushed very strongly for um, and we're really pleased to see as part of the Just Transition Fund at WWF, but it needs to go further and the recovery and resilience plans can in some ways go towards that, but really this needs to be much more systemic and, and we need to know that what we're talking about, I mean, the fact that gas is getting into everything shows we're not really there yet with our systemic change. Um, so yeah, I didn't see any questions directly for me in the chat. Um, on the heating question, I, I think there's there's a I would I would just raise a point. There's a tendency as well to to argue we need gas for heating. Um, it doesn't actually show that um, we can move straight to heat pumps. Um, we can we can do this within the next ten years. Um, so I think this is something that you know we we really need to to move away from our original way of thinking into something new. Um, how we get there, like I said, I think we need principles. I'll leave it there, thank you. I think that I have the, the feeling that Ilan is gonna say that we're not gonna need to move into something new, but in something quite old and established, and that is uh, humankind, the, the better, the, our better selves. Ilan, am I, am I wrong? No, I mean, thanks so much. I think that what we've heard for, from you and, and the others is exactly what's important. And there were some great questions which I've sort of answered in the chat, but really like to address then this final point about should we be using or how should we be using COVID-19 as an opportunity? And no one wants this. I mean, th this is not an opportunity. It is not the opportunity we want. On the other hand, we're here. So we have to make, do what we have with the terrible situation. And it has shown us so much because when it came to climate change and environmentalism and justice, they said, well, you know what? We can't just stop air travel overnight, it's essential. But then we did. And they said, you know, the economy, we have to keep the economy going. And what are you going to do, you, green, you greenies, you lefties? If you change it, it just can't be done. But then we did. Now, the costs have been immense. And I don't mean financial costs, I mean human costs. This is not the sort of opportunity or transition that we want, but we've shown that we can do it. So the whole fundament is that we need to take responsibility and make the choices for ourselves to do it in such a way that we don't have the costs. By the time we are in a situation where our choice is mass death from a virus or mass death from lockdown, we have lost the game. It is up to us not to be playing that game, but to know where we have to go and to do it before it is too late. So this alludes to the question about how do we convince people that there are no natural disasters? Well, number one, stop using the phrase natural disaster. Number two, call them out and say, but prevention is better than cure. We could have done it. We should have done it. So again, let's go back to our values. Let's take responsibility Let's show what was done because of the pandemic and the horrible, horrible consequences of what was done, but nonetheless, take what was done and do so much better so that everyone gains. And the only people who lose are those who got us into this situation in the first place. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lan. Um, I would like to close with these words, but we have a, a question from Facebook. 
uh, from uh, Paul Tevenin, Te Te uh, which I would just like to pick up to close this conversation, which is about climate refugees, um, which is very central to this question of making half of the Earth inhabitable in the near decades. And uh, I think that going back to the values question, I think we should call a spade a spade. And the legal distinction between a refugee and a migrant is central here. A refugee is somebody in persecution. A migrant is somebody who's looking for a better economic life. Uh, it is very clear now that uh, uh, climate change, climate-induced change, uh, well, climate change will, will bring uh, um, less resources, less resources will bring conflict. And uh, it's not that all conflicts follow uh, climate deterioration or loss of, of ecosystem habitats, but it's clear that the loss of ecosystem and the loss of habitat will bring either a, a war, civil war, or a failed state. And it's also clear that uh, the cumulative effect of, uh, of uh, carbon dioxide is the, with the historic emissioners, which is, uh, the North uh, and uh, basically Europe, the United States and uh, the Soviet Union and now China, which have enjoyed the fruits of uh, energy. And it is these uh, emissions that are bringing misery and persecution to people fleeing for a better life from areas that have become unaccountable. It's very clear if you look at the arc of, uh, um, of drought from Afghanistan all the way to Morocco, that where you have this migration and also the migration from Central America to North America, where they're actually building a wall to keep people out uh, from the uh, economic and, and civil persecution that we have actually created. So at least in my view, there is this distinction about the migrant is, is no longer valid. So it's very clear that as is, is starting to happen in one of the many fragmented areas of the United Nations that uh, Ilan mentioned before, in the United Nations uh, uh, High Commission for Refugees and the new uh, ref uh, Covenant for Refugees. This is starting to be uh, recognized, uh, uh, but we are very much on the verge and um, of indeed creating something that is closer to our values. And, and let me say so, and let me close it at that, closer to a human nature. Humans are uh, animals that have uh, evolved to be kind to one another, to cooperate with one another. And this, uh, our current uh, misadapta mis misadaptation uh, condition of uh, extreme competition and extreme individualism is only uh, bringing us back to a state of non-civilization. And I'm not speaking about hunter gathering, I'm speaking about uh, the specter of climate barbarism, which we discussed uh, at length today. And at least to my great education, and, uh, and pleasure, and I hope yours as well. Uh, I would like to thank everybody for being with us for this couple of hours, our speakers especially, Lynn, Katie, Ilan, and uh, Leah and uh, Marie who've left us, and uh, looking forward to continue following uh, the European uh, Forum of Progressive Forces for the next couple of weeks. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, thank the interpreters for their work, uh, and thanks everybody for organizing this and for being here. Thank you very much.